from the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. I'm getting ahead of myself here. <clears throat> I want to talk today about a very, very uh, to me it was an intriguing topic. And that's when Satan comes to church. The title of the message is when Jesus and Satan come to church. And I just wanted you to know that there are times when uh, we have an unwelcome visitor that comes into the place we meet. Now I want to explain this to you. Uh oh. Oh. I need to go forward to the sermon. Anyway, when Jesus comes to church, the let me explain this. The church is the body of Christ. If you're a born-again believer, then you cannot be inhabited by Satan. So let me clarify that. So if you are a Christian, you don't have to worry about Satan coming into your life as a believer. However, when believers meet together, it is possible for someone who's not a believer to come in to the group where we're meeting. And the danger we have at that point is, how can you tell? You can't tell by the external appearance of a person if this person is a fellow believer or not. You, you can't tell. So you have to uh, become spiritually discerning. So what we're going to talk about today is, how, is uh, when Jesus comes to church and then when Satan comes into the place where the church meets, uh, how can, what is he up to in that place? Now, when Jesus comes to church, the first point is people are impacted. And I want to invite you to stand with me for reading God's Word. This is a fascinating passage of Scripture. And I'm going to invite you to join me for prayer and ask the Lord to speak to us. So let's just bow our heads and pray for a moment. Father, we want to thank you for your Word. And we thank you, Father, for the powerful message that you have in this Scripture. Your word. Speak to us now. We want to hear your voice and help us to understand what we're hearing so that we could apply it in our life. Thank you for helping us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 21. It says, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, uh, he, that's Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have, you to do, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know not who you are, the Holy One. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet. And come out of him, and when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. You may be seated. Now the first thing I wanted to say today is when Jesus Christ comes to church, the lives of people are impacted. When it says uh, they were astonished at his teaching, um, I want to just emphasize that when you hold the Bible in your hand, you're not just holding a book. You're not just holding a leather with some pages sewn into it. You are holding in your hand the very Word of God. It is uh, 
inspired by God's Holy Spirit. It is without any error. It is possible only for you to understand the Word of God if you're truly a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. There are those who are critics of the Scriptures who are not true believers because they don't believe or accept the words of God and they try to explain it or argue against it but the fact is you can't totally understand the word of God until you become a believer. So if you're here today and you're seeking, you say, well, I would like to know the truth. Well, you can know the truth. Let me emphasize that. You can. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you do and when you do, then the Holy Spirit comes into you and He enables you to see things, understand things. And when you read the scripture... Truth will jump off the page into your heart and mind and you'll see things and understand things that you couldn't understand before. And if you, if you have been through that process like I have, you realize there is a change in your life. It's, you're not the same anymore. And that's my whole point. It's when Jesus Christ comes into your life or he comes into a group where people are meeting, the fact that Jesus Christ is here in this place impacts our life. You can't just read the Word of God and walk away and be the same anymore. You're, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, He transforms your life. And the Word of God is absolutely essential. It, the Word of God contains words of life and hope for us. The way to have lives changed, the way to have our culture changed, the way to change the whole world is found in this collection of 66 books that we call the Bible. And it's how God talks to us. You know, when I was not a believer, I used to ask the question, well, if there's a God, why doesn't he just talk to me? Well, the truth is, he had written down by, through inspired authors, they had written down the words of God for me to read, but I couldn't understand them because I was not trusting. I didn't trust people and I didn't trust God that I didn't know. And so I had a ton of questions, and I wanted to know, how could I know God, and why can't I hear Him? Well, when I became a believer, wow, it's like I could read the Bible, and things that I didn't see and understand became real to me, and He transformed my life. This verse that we just read, it's a simple verse, where it says, they were astonished at His teaching. For he taught them as one having authority. It's simple, but it's very profound. Jesus Christ is the greatest example. If you want to know how to live a Christian life, you look at the life of Jesus Christ, and he is the perfect example of that. <laughs> Jesus routinely attended the synagogues, and when he would go to the synagogues, he would teach wherever he went. Luke chapter 4 verse 31 tells us, and I need to go to the next slide. I don't know why that's not working today. <laughs> I'll let you work on that. Luke 4.31 says, Then he went down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And the fact is that Jesus Christ would go into city and city and city, and everywhere he went, he went to worship with the believers. Now, even though these were Jews and they weren't believers in Him yet as the Son of God and as the Messiah, He attended worship when they gathered together, He went. And wherever He went, He would end up picking up one of the scrolls and reading the Scriptures. Only the difference is when Jesus Christ would read, He was reading His own Word. And He spoke with authority, and He spoke with power, and the people had never heard anyone read the Scriptures like Him. And so they were pretty much amazed because he didn't just read it and then set it down. He read it and it came alive to them. It was like he was speaking with such thank you, with such power. And, and so not everyone's a teacher. You know, sometimes people want to get up and they want to get in front and they want to teach and speak. Not everyone's a teacher, but everyone is supposed to be a learner. I'm a learner. If I'm not constantly learning from the scriptures... I have absolutely nothing to share with you, okay? When I do study the scriptures, he fills me up, and now my tank's full, and I'm sorry, we got, I don't know how long time we got today, but my tank's full today. I've been studying the scriptures, <laughs> and, and I've got a message to deliver today, but it's from him. Not my message. 
And, and, and so when Paul told Timothy, for example, to preach the word, what he was saying was to communicate it, to deliver it, to share the, the word of God so that uh, people could hear God's word itself. And yet today I find many people come and they want to be entertained. We have an entertainment culture. And the entertainment culture in which we live today wants their ears tickled. They want to hear what they want to hear. And if I don't say what someone wants to hear, then they want to go, I don't want to hear that. La, 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 I don't want to hear that because you're not saying what I agree with. Well, the truth is, <laughs> it doesn't matter so much what Rick says, what does matter is what God says. And if God inspires me and gives me a message of His Word, it's not me and it's not my message. It's His Word and it's His message, okay? <laughs> so that becomes important. And so I want to let you in on a secret. When I'm speaking, I'm learning too. It's like I'm not... <laughs> I don't know everything. God knows everything. So when I get up to deliver a message, He's filled me up with His Word and with the message that I am able by His Spirit to deliver to you. So when you hear me speaking and I'm at the pulpit, uh, sometimes things come out of my mouth or from the Word of God that I didn't even see. It's not in, always in my notes. Sometimes it is because I've prepared and I've prayed and I've prepared to deliver a message and sometimes He adds. <laughs> things and insight and I learn too and when I'm preaching I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> it's a high accountability there's a lot of people that want to get up in front and talk but there's a huge accountability because when you stand at the pulpit and you're proclaiming the, the truth of God we need to be careful that we're proclaiming truth according to the scripture not just something that we make up and, and, and I'll tell you why it's so important we have good news to proclaim the world is living in darkness. The world is living without hope. People are struggling in life. There's so many things that people are trapped in and in bondage to, and they can't deliver themselves. If people could deliver themselves, we wouldn't need a Savior. But the truth is, you and I, we cannot deliver ourselves, but we do have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. And He, is, he came because He loves you, and He even loves me. That's amazing. And He came because He loves us and He gave His life for you and me to save us and to give us the power to be changed. You want your life changed? No amount of medications will change your life. It may get you under control and get you calmed down or something. Maybe that's why my daughter tells me to take a chill pill. <laughs> take, take, take a chill pill, Dad. <laughs> I, get, I get kind of excited and wound up. And so... Uh, the next point I want to say is when we're, te when we're teaching the Word of God, the truth is there are people who are lost. And I need to go to the next, the next slide there. There's people that are lost and they need to be saved. And, 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 and the only way for a person to become saved is to hear the Word of God. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God itself. And we have to proclaim God's Word. If I just stand here and tell you stories and news... Well, that's interesting, but it's not going to transform anybody's life. And people need to believe, and they can't believe until they have faith, and faith is a gift of God. Let's go to the next scripture, Romans 10, 17. It says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The, the reason, as I said, that I proclaim the Word of God is because the Word of God is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. The Word of God gives us faith. All the questions that I used to ask before I became a believer, I could not find the answers to that anywhere else. I was spinning my wheels trying to find answers about God and eternity and why people treated each other the way they do and why do families split up and so forth. Why, are, why do people hurt each other and why are people struggling so greatly? It's because they don't have the Lord on the throne of their own heart. And whenever you're on the throne of your own heart, look out. You destroy your own life because me want to do it. I want to be in control. I want to do this. I want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I, I. Me, 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 right? And when we come to the place where we say, you know, I want to, I, I give up. I have made a mess of my life. 
And now I want to give my life to Jesus Christ and I want to let him take control of my life. <laughs> Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed, by the way, to stand here and to proclaim the word of God to you. <laughs> it is a great privilege. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. This means whoever you are, no matter what you have ever done in your life, God loves you. No matter who you are and no matter what has happened in your past, the truth is God has a plan of salvation for you. Did you just turn to somebody and say, God loves you? God loves you. <laughs> and, and here's another thing you can tell him. You say, God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. And it's a good plan. It's a good plan. Okay. In this passage, it says, they were astonished at his teaching. Well, sometimes people get astonished at my teaching, but it's not the same reason. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Jesus taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. He taught with authority, and I'll tell you why Jesus taught with authority. It's because I'll give you a secret. He's God. Thank you. That's why he has authority. He has authority because he's God. He also has authority because he was there in the very beginning. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Did you know Jesus is the one through whom everything that exists was made? Jesus. Jesus is the one who created everything. He has all authority, all power, all wisdom, all knowledge. He is the source of life and light for us. He is everything. In Him was life, and the life was the light of Him. I used to try to go through life, and I will tell you what I did. I used to go through the life kind of tripping and dragging and kicking things and running into things. And then when I finally gave Jesus Christ His rightful position as Lord of Lords and King of Kings in my heart, the light came on. And I realized all the filth that was around me. If you come to that place and you realize the world is a mess. You try to get through this life without Jesus Christ. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. And you're going to get skinned up knees. Because you're just not going to make it without Jesus. Second main point. Is when Jesus comes to church. Some people resist the Lord. It says, now there was a man with an unclean spirit. As I told you, if you're a believer, don't worry that, the, 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 that Satan's going to come in and indwell your life. That's not going to happen because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Once you become a born-again child of God, the Holy Spirit indwells you. You are the temple of God's Holy Spirit. Not part of the Spirit. All of the Holy Spirit indwells you. You have all the knowledge, wisdom, power that the Lord has Himself residing in you. The question is not how much of Him do you have, it's how much of you does He have. Amen. Have you surrendered your life to Him? Or are you still wanting to be in control? You want to be saved, but I don't really want to give Him control yet. I want to kind of, and you're in this, even the duck commander, <laughs> in 2012 had said he was engaged in a spiritual warfare and so is every other believer. We're engaged in a spiritual warfare going on within us. That's why we get some weary sometimes. Anytime Jesus Christ met somebody who was demon possessed, guess what? Jesus kicked the demons out. And this event where he came into the synagogue and he was reading he sees the man and he knows because he's, he knows everything and he can see spiritually. So you and I can't sit there and go, don't I look nice today? You know, it doesn't, I'm sure the Lord is pleased with me because my color coordinated. <laughs> you know, the Lord looks through you and me and he sees everything in us. He knows every thought. He knows what's in our heart. Don't say it, but I know some of you are thinking, oh me. I need to get right with God. Yes, you do. So do I. Don't we all? And so the devil knows God. 
Satan doesn't come to church in order to worship God. You may have come today, and I hope you did, coming to worship God. You came to the right place. Sometimes when those who are under the influence of Satan come among us, the intention of Satan is not to worship. It's to cause trouble. It's to resist God's will. To distract us from why we're here. Every time Jesus met somebody demon-possessed, he kicked the demons out. And this event that happened here happened in a place where people were gathering to worship and to read Scripture. They had just read the prophet Isaiah. The devil knows God, but he doesn't come to worship. James 2, 18 and 19, might, you might wonder, am I making this up? No, I'm not. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He said, you believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Don't you think Satan knows there's one God? Don't you think Satan knows who Jesus Christ is? Of course he does. Don't you think he knows the Word of God? Certainly. He's had thousands of years to memorize it. He knows how to quote it and misquote it. He knows to take the truth and mix error with it and throw it at people and see what will stick. He will do anything, and if you think you can outsmart him, he's been doing this for a long time. You, when, when Satan comes knocking, just say, Jesus, would you please answer the door? Just I let Jesus answer the door. Don't try to get into a debate with 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 people who are possessed of evil. They're just going to try to run you around and around. <clears throat> the devil knows God, but he didn't come to worship him. James 2, 18, 19, it says, You do well, even the demons believe and they tremble. They tremble because they know what's coming. They've read the Word of God. They've read the end of the story. And so they're trying to cause as much trouble as they can before the end of the book comes around. I'm talking about the book of Revelation. You can read that. The devil knows there's only one God. He didn't come to worship. He wants to substitute false religion in the place of true faith. He doesn't actually mind if you show up. He just hopes that when you show up, you get distracted. Do you notice we had several problems happening today in the, in the service at the beginning? And, 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 and I wasn't aware that somebody wasn't going to be here on the media. A couple things weren't set up, and so we were doing that, and I thought... Oh, interesting. My topic today is when Satan shows up at church. And I went, okay, kind of interesting. But greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world, and we're going to overcome. You know, you know, so I, I'm a little, I was embarrassed by, I was running up and down and everything like a chicken here. You know? But the truth is, Jesus wins. Because in the end, we're going to do everything, we're doing everything in order. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to honor our Savior. <laughs> what Satan likes to do is he loves to see people go to church to talk about other Christians. Don't talk about Jesus. Don't submit to Jesus. Talk about somebody else. You just got distracted. He loves to see us lift up ourselves. I'm, of course, I'm better than those other guys. <laughs> I know more than they do. I'm probably the most spiritual person in this place. <laughs> it's like, it's danger though. Isn't that what Satan does? If he can get you to go to self, pride, be dis, dis, divisive, divisive, whatever, split people up. <laughs> Anything Satan can do to distract us, discourage us, He'll do it, because if he can get us focused on anything else than Jesus Christ and his word, he just won a little battle. He can't win the war. He lost the war already. The war was won at the cross. But if he can get us to start fussing with one another, we forget, who is my real enemy? Oh yeah, it's not my brothers and sisters, is it? Uh -uh. I'm so glad for the harmony and peace we have here. I'm glad to be pastor here, because this is a great place to be. 
He loves to see people do these things. He loves it when we're preoccupied with anything else except Jesus Christ. And he loves it when somebody starts going around saying, you hurt my feelings. I was thinking, if I just looked at the cross, I'd say, I hurt Jesus' feelings. I caused him to have to die for me. Who in the world do I think I am to take offense at some, some little thing that somebody did or said or forgot to do or whatever? And Boy, I'm really offended now. It's like, forget that. I just look to Jesus and it takes that away. I say, you know what? Jesus did that for me. Forgive everybody else. I love everybody else. Nobody's going to get me distracted from loving you. And the devil goes to church because he's looking for prey. You know what the devil's looking for? He's looking for somebody that he can victimize. He was spiritually oppressing this man in the synagogue. And when... The demon was confronted by Jesus. He said, let us alone. I think he was talking about himself and the man he was, he was oppressing. I don't know. It just says us. But I think it possibly could be just the demon and the man. He said, let us alone. Kind of like, hey guy, I'm on your side. Yeah, right. He's trying to ruin everybody's life. And so Jesus has, has, had confronted this before. In fact, he told Simon Peter something interesting in Luke 22, 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you. See, I'm not making this up. Satan's looking to get you. <clears throat> Satan asked for you, Peter, that he may sift you as wheat. When I was in the grain business, we, we had sift, grain sifters. And the grain sifters are these great contraptions that are like a basket, but they're big, and they have 100 or 200 horsepower motors in there. They're doing this to the grain. That's how you sift the grain. You shake it through a screen, and you try to separate the good grain from the rocks and the sticks and the other fiber that's in there. And that's what he was saying is, I want to shake up Peter's life. I want to get him weary, discouraged. Divided, distracted from Jesus. That's what Satan was trying, always tries to do. Peter knew what it was like to be influenced by Satan, didn't he? Remember he had denied Jesus Christ three times? He got scared. He saw they had arrested Jesus. They were questioning Jesus. And then they crucified Jesus Christ. And he denied that he even knew him. And then he came under a great guilt and conviction. You ever been there? When you've done something in your life you shouldn't have done and now you get under this oppressive conviction and guilt and shame in your life. Peter wrote this, he said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan's looking to get you. Any minute you get your eyes off of Jesus and you start putting your eyes on one another, Anytime you get your eyes off the Word of God and you start trying to take control yourself, you don't even realize it. You just got into the self mode, into the pride mode, and away from surrender to God and surrender to Jesus Christ, and you are in a grave, dangerous place to be. I'm telling you. 2 Corinthians 11 tells me that even sometimes preachers get themselves so caught up with themselves that they edify themselves and not Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. I'm not going to name anybody, but I'm just going to tell you it's a great danger when a preacher begins to elevate himself above other people and he begins to think he's all that instead of being totally surrendered and grateful that God has even spared him life. It's dangerous because he says, therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. They're not really ministers of righteousness. They're self-seeking. And you can tell there are sometimes preachers who are self-seeking. They got the ego that's taller than Mount Everest, you know. And, 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 and what you want to look for is humility. The devil goes to church because he actually wants to be worshipped. 
Satan wants to be worshipped. Isaiah 14, 12 says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you, you are cut down to the ground, you are weakened, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, this is Satan, Satan Lucifer saying, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And God kicked him out. You want to fall? Ego. Pride. Arrogance. So offensive to God. I'm serious. Offensive to God. Humility. The broken and the contrite spirit. A broken heart before God. That he endears. He loves. You know what the devil said to Jesus? His ego, Satan's ego is so big, he even challenges Jesus himself. That's ego. Matthew 4, 9, he said to Jesus, All these things I'll give you, Jesus, if you will fall down and worship me. There he said it. I mean, that's about as simple and clear and plain as it can be. Worship me and I'll give you the world. I know what Jesus is thinking. I have created the world. If, if it weren't for me, this whole place would fall apart. And if it were up to you, you'd destroy it. Satan. <laughs> And that's the way it is. Satan actually would, wants to kill people. He wants to take the life of anyone who doesn't worship him. I'm not making any of these things up. Revelation 13 verse 15 says, He, the evil one, was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Satan would love to end your life. He would love to divide you, distract you, discourage you, and in any way cause you to be out of the mission of God and purpose that God has for your life. And we need Jesus, don't we? I mean, that's enough talking about that guy. But it's like, you need to be aware that there is an evil one. He's real, and he's evil, and he, he hates us. He wants to destroy our life. But greater is he, the one, the Son of God, who loves us and who empowers us to be victorious, overcomers in this world. We just need to be circumspect. That means be, be alert. Know what's going on around you. <laughs> this man, who I said couldn't help himself, was helped by Jesus. When he couldn't help himself, Jesus came to him. And when Jesus comes to church, he, Jesus, has all the authority. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out, he came out of him. Because Jesus has authority over Satan and over demons. Don't believe all this Hollywood nonsense that demons, the devil, uh, all this has any power over a believer. This is not true. That is a lie right out of the pit of hell. The truth is that you and I, if you're indwelt by God, you have the Holy Spirit of God within you. If you have the Holy Spirit of God within you, you don't need to be afraid about Satan. Be aware, because he's a liar and a deceiver, so be wise. But don't be afraid of him. Fear God, because he's the one that gives you life, and he could take life. He's the one we need to give our respect to. Listen to him. Listen to God. Satan would like us to all be so afraid of him that we change our life to let him be in control of our life. Don't do it. Listen to the Lord. When Jesus comes to church, and I'm talking now about the body of Christ, when Jesus comes to church, lives are changed. And today lives are still being changed by the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And praise God, he, the Lord, is still changing lives today. He's changing them in 2013. He'll be changing lives in 2014. And until Jesus comes back, he'll continue to change lives. You know what my desire is? I'll share my desire with you. Is to see Jesus Christ honored. As you and I help each other to become transformed by the Holy Spirit of God and His Word, the Word of God, for us to become true disciples of Jesus Christ, to follow Him, and to help others to become disciples of Christ.
That's the desire of my heart there. I want to see Jesus honored. You know how you honor God? Stop putting yourself first. Put him first. Humble yourself and ask the question, what would God have me to do? And do that. Do the, we say do the right thing. I kind of like that. Do the right thing. Do the thing that you believe God would have you to do. One thing he wants us to do is to be his witness and tell other people about Jesus. That's what he wants us to do. You might say, boy, that's awfully religious. No, it's not. I'm talking about a real relationship with a real person. His name is Jesus Christ. He has transformed my life. Luke 15, verse 10 says, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It's misquoted so many times. People say, the angels rejoice when someone repents. Well, they may. If they agree with God, they'll probably rejoice also. But it says there's joy in the presence of the angels of God. Guess who rejoices when a person gives his heart to Christ? The Lord. God does. God the Father gave His Son to save us. Jesus gave His life. He suffered and died for you and for me so that He could save us from our sin. They, Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, rejoice whenever someone says, I give up with my old life and sin and I want to give it back to God and leave it at the cross and I want to surrender my life and ask Jesus to forgive me of my sin. God rejoices. He is fired up, we would say. He is rejoicing in heaven whenever someone gives his or her heart to Jesus Christ. What about you today? Are you here today and you say, this preacher is nuts. He's like, over the top, you know? What I'm telling you today is the truth. I'm trying to make it as simple and plain and clear as I possibly can. I'm telling you the truth today. I really am. Somebody told me, and it's a privilege for me to deliver the same message someone shared with me. And you know what else happens? And I love it. We had a birthday party for Pansy Hutchins. I won't tell you she's 80 years old, but I, but I, I want you to know this lady is awesome. She has a spirit of humility and service. She serves other people. She manifests and drips humility. So she'd be embarrassed for me to say that. I'm, that's the way it is. I'm just going to tell what she's like. She's a humble lady. She loves people. She loves the Lord. She serves Him. You know why she serves Him? She got saved. She got delivered from sin. She has a whole new life in Christ because even though she's not a kid anymore, she's a grown lady, but she's still a person who remembers Jesus saved her and now she lives every day to serve Him and to serve you and me. And she does. She serves other people all the time. That's what we're all supposed to do. We should all be about that. If you're born again, then our purpose should be to serve the Lord and to serve one another. The, the, the amazing thing about this is when you give your life to God and you serve other people, God gives His life to you and you end up ahead. You could give your whole life away to everybody. <laughs> to God and everybody else and God gives you his life and you're already richer than you ever were before. It's an amazing thing to be a child of God. So Peter's mother served him. You know, Peter's mother was very sick. It says, Simon's, wife, Simon's wife's mother, his mother-in-law, uh, lay sick with a fever and they told him about her at once. So he came, Jesus came, took her by the hand, lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and watched the next sentence. And she served them. She got saved, healed, and served them. That was her immediate reaction is to serve others. That is a mark of a Christian, is you want to serve other people. <laughs> Jesus served us. He is so humble. And, and so as she served the Lord, it continued the mark that women have done since. You know, Mary Magdalene and, the, and which other Marys? See, Mary, I want to make sure I quote it right. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph and Salome also followed Jesus and ministered to him when he was in Galilee and many other women. These women got it. They were like, they, they saw the master, they followed the master, they served the master, and when he was at the cross, they were there watching. 
Watch it. When Jesus comes to church, give notice to Satan because Satan knows he is under God's control and authority. He knows it. At evening when the sun set, they brought to Jesus all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. Satan hated this part. And the whole city was gathered together at the door of Peter. Get the picture of this village and all these people come to the door because Jesus is inside the home and probably somebody's passed the good news that Peter's mother-in-law has been healed and now she's fixing meals or whatever they were doing. So they all came to the door. Let us in. We want to see Jesus. And so I don't know if they came in or it doesn't say. It just says they came to the door and it says, Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he didn't allow the demons to speak because they knew him. He, he basically said to the demons, Shut up. Close your mouth. Don't speak. You see, the demons could say, You're the Holy One. They knew the truth. They had been in heaven before. They used to be in the group that worshipped and served the Lord in heaven and now they were kicked out because of pride and arrogance. Sin. Kicked out. They knew who Jesus was and he didn't want them to testify of him. He didn't want those who had rebelled against God the Father to testify that he is the Son of God. They lost their right they lost the privilege to tell other people the good news. They were no longer in the place of being a witness. The only person who can witness for Jesus Christ is a person who has surrendered his or her life to Jesus and received Jesus as your Savior. Amen. You, if you are a witness, a person born again, can be a witness, a, a person who tells other people the good news of Christ. Only you can. But you can. And we must. There is no one else qualified or fit. No one else authorized except you if you're a believer. We're it. God has one plan. Sinners saved by grace through faith in His Son can tell other people I was sick and he healed me of spiritual sickness. I was dead in sin and he saved me, forgave me, and gave me a whole new life. You can tell other people. Be careful who you follow. Be careful who you listen to. Be wise. Don't allow yourself to be deceived by the evil one. He comes around trying to get our eyes off Jesus. Immediately, don't look down. Don't look at one another. Get your eyes on Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. We serve Him and we worship Him, Jesus. Would you stand with us? Steve's going to come and lead us in the song. Do you realize your assignment today? And great privilege of life, if you're a believer, is to tell other people the good news of Jesus Christ. No one else can except you and me. We are blessed.